that you take from the rich and give to the poor, that is not popular, not even here, uh, not even in England. Uh, uh, I think it was a packet into, which it actually is, um, some, they are, can be conditional, transferred, but conditional on a universalistic basis. For example, condition that you have a kid, condition that you are unemployed, condition that you have a certain age, old age. Uh, so, so these things are, there can be conditions attached, but these rules, they apply for everybody. <coughs> these programs are popular. And the popularity, I think, is enormously important. So, I'm an economist like uh, the two others here, but so we are always asked about the, the how we're going to tax finance. This. Uh, so I think so the, the economics of these things are much simpler than the politics. The politics, or the combination of economics and politics of, of these problems are, are the complicated thing. Um, so let me just remind you of some, some important aspect of this, very important also in development context. The visibility of the cost of the programs, that's very clear and distinct. You, can, you, you see it immediately, the cost side of the programs. But the benefit side is very much hidden. It's hidden because it is a, the benefits, to see the benefits of, of welfare programs, you have to compare the presence when you have the, when you have the system there with what would happen if it wasn't there. What kind of traps you would fall into? What kind of undernutrition you would have? What kind of school attendance would have? What kind of child labor you would have? All these things would be very important uh, to understand or see the benefits, because then just, just the benefits are something, are costs that aren't there. Uh, and these things, I, I think that it's important. So how should you say? A social education for any social reformer in any developing countries uh, to learn this, these things that the, to, to make the benefit side more visible because when the benefit side is more visible then people are more willing to uh, uh, tax finance these things and most countries uh, take India as uh, one example it doesn't have a tax system at all in the first place for example, in India, how many taxpayers are there in, in India? 1% of the population pay tax, income taxes. Of course, they pay other taxes, but, but income taxes, 1% of the population. The whole agriculture sector is, is excluded from paying taxes. That's been so, so since 1948. And, uh, and of course, you can't run a proper country when you don't tax people and redistribute and finance collective goods that the, that the people need. And again, you have to advocate uh, or propagate and have good arguments for for social reformers in the country. They have to run these programs themselves. Uh, that they that that they can learn some for good and bad some of the experiences of those countries introduce these schemes early on. And I I think Norway for sure, but I also think England introduced schemes like that when these countries were much poorer than, for example, South Africa today per capita uh, income. Uh, quite clear, uh, for, for, uh, South Africa is a rich country in Africa, as people know, so it's, it was an easy comparison. I think Tanzania is, is, is uh, below the level where right. we introduced on, on a broader scale, so many things. So that's the first thing. I'm going to add on some experiments that we did so in abstract modeling of these things. I think we can learn from everything, even from economics. Um, also looking for the following case. We, we, we took into account both the labor supply, the need for insurance, the allocation of labor across sectors and activities and whatever, in an abstract manner. And we asked the following question. And we had all, all kinds of shocks that so that this system was supposed to be. And we asked the following question. Which kind of social arrangement would benefit the poor the most, provided that the scheme had to be funded by a majority rule in the country. That is more or less a sort of an imitation of the, of the description you gave of that it need to, you need to be in elections in, in order to implement this. And um, so the, the, uh, to make a long story very short, so the universalistic spending, which was one of the candidates, that um, we always have in, in this political equilibrium or whatever you would call it, 
majority vote would always be for a positive tax and, and a redistribution scheme or a social insurance scheme. And uh, the cost of this would be sort of, uh, with some cost, of course, there may be some people that don't work when they, when they um, get handles, as you said. <coughs> but it wasn't a major thing. The, mo the most important thing was that the, the targeted programs, the means-tested programs, so the, in most of the uh, most of the application of this model was that it had zero support. So the cheap thing that was cheap didn't have any support because it, 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 this is more like the abstract whole we imitate the world, but they, they lower, they lower the target, and they lower the target uh, or the threshold below which you are supported. You lower that, you lower that until it's zero, and and that again I think is a is a it's just what is could be called perhaps sustainable welfare spending is very rarely cheap, cost efficient welfare spending. Is that the sustainable welfare spending also is a broad based, social insurance based, where you see the sort of the there are benefits that go also to people who don't need it. The terms of the social insurance are better for the poor than the rich, that are all redistribution, but this is not the argument in favor of the scheme. The argument in favor of the scheme that it provides something that the market fails to provide by itself. You they can't buy it privately. And that's what gives it uh, uh, legitimacy uh, in, the, um, in the population. So then people, when, we, when you talk about these things, then people say, well, but this was, um, this was, uh, uh, when you didn't have altruism, and, and people are not so egoistic as, as, as economists say, and I agree, I agree people are not like that, they have more solidarity feeling, they feel group identity, and that maybe it's regional, maybe it's ethnic, maybe it's social, or a combination. So we added that on to, to the exercise, but what people tend to forget is that these solidaristic feelings, they also support universalistic planning. So you benefited even more from the university scheme, even though we know had uh, uh, also a positive funding for the targeted scheme. I'm not saying that, that this is the answer. I think the answer is a combination of exercises like this and real world studies. But I think we should not exclude ourselves from learning from abstract, uh, sort of concrete, uh, uh, logically modeling of, of, the, of the mechanism. Because these are very, you can't do experiments. And you have to prepare for, for the interesting thing by studying some of the things also in abstract. So, um, uh, so the, I just say this as a, as a, I'm going to add a little on to this, that the, but I say this as a support to, I think, the, both of the previous, both to Stephen and to Trina. Um, there is a, we talk about these things as cash transfers. So, so let me just, just assume for the sake of the argument, we agree on universalistic spending. Finished. But you can do, you soften this up. And that has it sort of been very, uh, I think it hasn't been uh, understood quite well. If you combine cash transfer with some in-kind provision, you can soften it up in the sense, I'll give you some example. And then I said uh, what I think is more general. And the bond didn't like it, but in Sri Lanka, they had food programs. Remember that, uh, that uh, Sri Lanka had a very high expected lifetime uh, early on compared to its income per capita. It was like Cuba and China and Sri Lanka. It was really, uh, low child mortality compared to other countries with similar income levels per capita. Part of the reason was healthcare, I think, but also a food program. They just gave out for free food, food on the street. Of course, this food was decent, it was good, but it wasn't, you didn't get any Michelin star for the food. So most of the snobbish people, they opted out freely. They didn't eat that food. Yeah, so they, but that was cheap, that's fine, you just kept the house, but it was available for everybody. So this is targeted by self-selection to the program. So I think more seriously, Norway had uh, programs like this. Um, for example, Husbanken, this Norwegian housing bank, that was a social democratic, uh, at least it was defended by social democrats. 
I can't remember who initiated it, but, but uh, some of these programs were important. It was, it was subsidized housing, but it was subsidized for everybody, but you have to qualify for certain rules. And that was that the size, the size of the house shouldn't be too big. Again, the upper class opted out. It was free for them also to get the subsidized credit. You didn't have to have a targeted, you are soft targeting for self-selection. So they, so they opted out, they didn't want to have, they want to have big houses They're up in the Formicol here, they, they are still there. Uh, just, it's very strange, in, in Oslo actually, the, the upper class moved off on the shadow side of the city. That's the only city, uh, because they were so afraid for pollution from, from this area close to here. That was the reason why they, they, they moved gradually, they were so afraid that they had to stay together. So they moved gradually. So it was a tyranny of small decisions. So the upper class ended up in the shadow side. And sort of the, the nice side, that's the uh, Wolberg, a little bit east of that. That's the sunny side of the city. There are more ordinary people there. Not anymore, maybe, but, but, but uh, that was a digression. Um, so, I, uh, so this, uh, I think, some of these, you, you can combine in kind provision. Uh, with uh, with some cash transfers, one one scheme that uh, I've been mean, involved in in a large study of is this cycle program in Bihar in India, where you sort of give for free. It's almost for free. You have to finance a little bit uh, on top of this uh, for the family itself. A bicycle for every girl, 13 years of age, uh, uh, who uh, saving on the continuous route. Uh, so whether they, and, they, and it's unconditioned in the sense, once they start schooling, then uh, they don't take the bike away if they stop schooling after half a year. So we can, now they started in 2006, so, uh, and now we can study the program because it had been evolving for so many years. So now some of the girls are so, or are women, women, and they are old enough not so we can see when they're married, did they take education, how many kids have they, uh, what kind of, Poverty they have, all these things, and the, the impact of the program is very high. We empower girls. You, you change social attitudes in, in the villages, and be, uh, girls in India, uh, as many of you would, would know uh, in detail, are poorly treated. So this is really a necessary type of program. It is a cash universalistic program, but it has this element of in-kind provision. The, the, the money is given in cash, but you have to pay, uh, you have to buy a, uh, a bike for it. Um, and, and you're free to opt out. If, if you have a bike, you're free to opt out. You, you don't have to do it. But there's sort of social change, and so the school enrollment increased by 30%. Uh, there are many other things that the uh, change that don't go, go in detail. But this, uh, we are not yet f finished with everybody. I do this together with an Indian woman called Shabana Mitra. Uh, she's not completely finished, but almost. So, so this is, again, an example of this soft uh, targeting in, in the sense that you, you sort of you self-select. Self-selection is so, not so strong uh, here. It's more that these people had the opportunity to send their girls to school beforehand. But what the program does is not only make it financially possible to do it, but it also make it socially acceptable because they know that all the other girls have bikes. All the other girls are going to school, so they bike and get school uniforms and a good atmosphere for development. <laughs> um, so they, they, they worry that Trina mentioned sort of that, that handouts are bad. Um, people don't, uh, or people think that, that those who get handouts for free, they don't work. So the very again, you think about, you always think here's here's my advice. You always think what, how is this in the upper side of the income distribution? So I used to say in Norwegian that there are some people who, some go by nav, and some people who go by av. So they, I translate this nav is the social security where you get the, the you get the welfare benefits. And some people go on inheritance. So it's a similar thing. Um, in economic terms, it's very, it's very related. But, but you never raise it as a concern. So if, if you're so concerned about the, the danger that people get handouts, why is handouts that go through time 
within dynasties. Why are these, these mystically sort of <laughs> making people work hard and very... Uh, so then the 100% inheritance tax would be the proper policy to, to prevent it, to prevent the upper class from... Uh, and it's, uh, but it, the reason why I'm saying this is because all these discussions in the poor countries and the rich countries, they have a completely different theory about social behavior in the upper part of the income distribution and the lower part of the income distribution. It's just as if taxes that, that you're going to finance in the bottom, they are much more expensive taxes. And taxes in the top, they are uh, benefits that go to people on top, they are mysteriously always to the positive. Uh, for that. And it, 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 well, I'm saying this not to be just not just to be entertaining, <laughs> but 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 because I think it's in, I think the rhetoric around these things I think is important because we we can laugh at ourselves. After, for example, the economists uh, hundred years back, they taught uh, what is the highest tax that any country can have. It was less than ten. So the BB is completely uh, intolerable to have taxes beyond 10 percent, and you, as we margin taxes. So and you, as you know, so the taxes have been a little bit higher, and they have gone fine. So very often it is it is on the perception of things that are very different from what we are used to are very important to sort of challenge by uh, political rhetoric for for social reformers. I'm not thinking about introducing anything from outside in Tanzania. I think we can just, if they ask us, we can sort of tell, yeah, this is the experience that we have, yes. But I started at the half. Okay. Okay, I just wrong off. I have to take my, um, my 18 proposal for the for the UN. I thought you were doing this because this one took well, but it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Uh, so. so the next will be like this. <laughs> okay. So what is the 18 um, uh, the 18 proposal that should have been there but isn't? That is that all countries should commit to take 10 percent, for example, of their GDP. It can be higher if you like. GDP and give it to everybody as an equal share to everybody. It can be due in a combination or in kind and in cash, it can be due in different ways. But the basic thing is that this commitment. First of all, it's important that this is a proposal I have together with Debar Shrey. has been, he's an Indian American economist. So in India, when we have discussed this in India, and I've done it many times, that it, it raises a good discussion. I think maybe I can learn, uh, we have written a little bit about it, there uh, are more to come. So the proposal is, and why, so here's the reasoning, and I'll end with that. So here's the reasoning why we want to have a universal basic share or development bonus to everybody. It is because in all countries, a substantial fraction of the income is created collectively. It's created by the absence of conflict. It's created by the absence of killing each other. Is it? It's, it's it created in the absence of Rwanda in 1994. It's, it's, it's created by the absence of the, the war, 50 years old war in Colombia between the FARC and other guerrillas and the paramilitaries and the government. It's, it's, it's created by some sort of collective interaction between people. And, and nobody has property rights to these things. Very often people think that they are always go so well. Norway and Sweden had a world record in strikes and lockouts between the First World War and Second World War. The English sort of historians studied the, the Scandinavian history and said, how are they so docile? They're, they're not uh, fighting in, uh, in, uh, in England compared to... to and I, I think after the war it was a little bit opposite. So, but the absence of... Just in one year, 1931, we had more strike, more lost working days than in the entire period, 1945 to 1975. Uh, so it's, it's a tremendous change. Why, why should somebody have the property rights to, to, to the extra income that comes from this? Of course, this is a huge argument in favor of schemes that redistribution against. But the most important thing is that, and then I stop, is that doing this in this way that you said, that you have it as a share, that means that every citizen 
in a sense, get the property rights in the development of the country. The globalization, if there are gains from that, well, it's shared. Uh, robots, maybe not so, maybe Tanzania is not ready yet for that, but uh, there can be other development uh, policies. Uh, so it is, it gives collective reasons to organize in order to get these benefits. And you can be more sure that, that, that the, the benefits of development are shared. So this is the political economy of sort of having either welfare spending, welfare spending can be targeted in this way, but if you introduce it in India, for example, it will be diluted immediately by inflation and then, but if you tie it to, to the GDP per capita, then it raises continuously with, with the higher economic growth and so on. And I think this is uh, uh, important uh, for, for the support of these things. Economists are too obsessed by sort of individual incentives. It is the social, collective, ration, the in, the, and synthesis, collective rationality that really counts for development. Development is coordination. It is getting things moving together. It's not individual uh, incentives only. Of course, they, they are also present. And then so. Thank you. Stephen and Zina to come and join me here and please put on a microphone, switch it on.